Welcome, everyone, to Class Template Argument Deduction for Everyone. Uh, my name is Stefan T. Lawade, and since 2007, uh, I have worked on Visual CS Plus's implementation of the CS Plus Standard Library, or the STL, as I like to call it. Um, so today we're going to be talking about a CS Plus 17 feature, um, and how you can use it in your own code, how you can use it in library code, some corner cases uh, to watch out for, um, that I have found uh, while implementing this uh, in the standard library. Um, so as we get started, um, please hold your questions until the end. Um, use your smartphone to write down the slide number if you have a question or a comment about a slide, and then I can easily reverse back to them um, at the end of the talk. Um, everything I'm gonna talk about today is standard. Usually I have a disclaimer, unless otherwise specified. I don't believe I have any such, unless otherwise specified uh, this time. Um, also, because class template argument deduction is a mouthful, I will always abbreviate it to CTAD. Uh, that's what I mean when I say CTAD. Uh, this feature um, is available in all of the major compilers right now. Uh, in Visual Studio 2017, uh, it shipped uh, in its complete form in update 15.7. Uh, the current update is 15.8. Uh, but you do need to compile with the C++ 17 compiler option, uh, which is not the default uh, in the IDE. Otherwise, you're going to get an error um, that basically says you need to provide the template arguments in C++ 14. Um, so if you see that error, you just need to go in your properties and add C++ 17 or your build system. Uh, okay, so all of the examples that I'm going to use today are either slightly fictionalized types that I've written or actual standard library types. And this is just because uh, the standard library, essentially everybody uses it, or if you've written your own, you're imitating the STL. So you're gonna be familiar with it. Um, this is also uh, by virtue of shipping with the compiler. It's the first library to completely support class template arg deduction. Uh, there, I just said the whole thing. Um, in all of its class templates. Uh, so I can present a finished picture rather than a work in progress. Um, also, because the standard library is quite complicated, uh, it's gonna illustrate lots of interesting scenarios, like what happens when you need to do perfect forwarding, what happens when you have a range constructor. Um, and also, working on it you know, all day, every day, uh, means that I'm familiar with all these types. But because CTAD is a core language feature, uh, by no means is it restricted to the STL. In fact, it will automatically work with many class templates. We'll see uh, when it does and when it doesn't. Uh, you'll be able to use it in Boost, your own libraries, uh, you know, Facebook's uh, Folly library, they've got class templates in there, so I hear you can use it with that, um, especially as they implement, you know, deduction guides. Um, okay, so let's rewind to before CS plus 17, this will be, you know, anywhere from CS plus 98 to CS plus 14. Um, what did we do with templates before then? Uh, well, let's start with function templates. So you can write a function template. Here, this is the CS plus 14 dual range equal overload. Um, this is templated on a couple of input iterators, init1 and init2. Um, these are parameters. We need to know the concrete argument types in order to instantiate actual object code or machine code that will be executed on the processor. Uh, but we don't need to provide this in the source code explicitly. Instead, with a function call, um, like calling std equal with sbegin send uh, against putter and putter plus n, uh, the type information that we need is already in the types of the function arguments. Um, the init1 will be deduced by the compiler to be a set int iterator. And init2 here, I'm saying that it's gonna be a const array of long long, uh, so the input iterator will be a const long long star. Uh, by not having to provide template arguments in angle brackets, this makes function templates far more usable. Imagine if every time you called an STL or other function template, you needed to provide all of the arguments in angle brackets. That would be horrible. And in fact, it would limit evolution of the library. Uh, between CS plus uh, 03 and CS plus 11, we were able to add move semantics to the language. So lots of things that used to be a certain type in CS plus 03 became um, perfect forwarding R value references in CS plus 11. This especially affected uh, std pair. Uh, and that was possible only because the vast majority of users were not passing explicit template arguments. In fact, whenever they were, um, sometimes they had problems, hence a previous talk I had, don't help the compiler. Um, now, template arg deduction, because it is trying to figure out what type we need from the constructor arguments, we need to go through a fairly complicated list of rules. Uh, this can cause failure in some scenarios, and this failure is desirable. For example, if I try to call std equal with a list begin and a vector end, those are different types. Um, the compiler will politely say, I cannot possibly deduce a single type in it one that could make um, that type equal to the list iterator or the vector iterator. 
Um, so it's expected that sometimes template arm deduction will fail when we follow these rules. Um, so you can provide explicit template arguments to a function template, uh, and sometimes you must, like with make shared, but in general, you want to let that information flow through um, implicitly. Uh, however, before CS plus 17, we did not get that sort of implicit flow through, flow through behavior for class templates. Instead, we had to specify exactly which type we wanted. So if we had a stood pair, even if we construct it right then and there from a couple of integers, we had to say pair of int and int. Uh, the compiler wouldn't help you even though the types are right there. Now, all my examples, because I'm an STL implementer, I figure if I, if I test it with int and it works, it's good. If I test it with stood string, even better, eh, we can ship this thing. Um, but in the real world, types are much more verbose. Sometimes they're, you know, my company, double colon, my complicated library, double colon, my actual type. So explicitly specifying the types can be very much more verbose than int. And whenever you specify type again, that's a chance to make mistakes. What if you accidentally truncate? What if you change the sign of something? What if everything matches right now, but then somebody goes and changes a type elsewhere? Um, this is especially possible when you start using lots of auto. Uh, such changes can ripple through your program, and then, oops, you've got truncation. Hopefully, the compiler will warn, but maybe not. Um, so we had a workaround that's quite well known. You can use function template argument deduction to compensate for the lack of CTAD for CS17. But this is bad in many different ways, and I've listed all the ones I could think of here. Um, you've got extra template machinery to perfectly forward arguments and perform to case so you get an expected pair type. That machinery is complicated. There are so many corner cases to it. It's also slow to compile. Um, if you don't like when your build takes you know, 40 minutes, some of that is due to all these function templates um, that are workarounds. Uh, every call to make pair is very slightly slowing down your compilation. Um, also, uh, in debug mode, um, you are going to actually have to step through actual function calls. So that's increased code size, uh, reduced debugging experience, it's very annoying. Um, and even if you ignore the actual execution, if you ignore the actual throughput, um, it's verbose. You've got this make underscore prefix, uh, you've got auto if you're gonna store it in a local variable, that's extra typing, when all you wanted was a pair. So in CS plus 17, things become better. Um, this is what I consider to be the hello world example of CTAD. Um, here I'm showing the only fully worked example uh, in my slide. I've got the include directives, I've got the using namespace std, which should not be used generally in production code, uh, but it makes the examples much less verbose, so I've got it here. Um, the actual example is just that one line, I wanna construct a std pair p from the argument 1729 and the string literal taxi cap. Um, then, this would not be actually used in practice, but I'm including it here to illustrate how you can detect what CTAD is doing in your program. Um, I can static assert that the declared type of P is the same as, and then the type that has been deduced for us, is pair of int and cons care star. So this is great. I didn't need to put all of the arguments in the angle brackets when I constructed my std pair. Um, so it's not limited to that specific form that I wrote. Um, CTAD will work with all of the usual syntax. You can construct with parentheses or with braces if you like uniform initialization. It will work with direct initialization or copy initialization with that equal sign in there. Um, and you can construct temporary variables. For example, if I have a vector of a user defined type that is somehow constructible from a pair and I don't have a pair handy, I can make a temporary pair and now I can simply say pair paren or pair brace, depending on which one I prefer, um, and I will directly invoke pairs constructor. If I step into this in debug mode, I will go from this in place back line, assuming I can step into the STL, to directly pairs constructor. No helper, make pair function template. So you're putting less stress on the front end, on the back end inline, um, less debug cogen size. It's a win all around. So what is CTAD doing? It's very tempting to say, oh, I'm constructing a pair, magic happens, and we're done. Um, but especially once we get into library code, we need to actually understand at a fine grain level what's happening. So CTAD happens when you construct an object. You need to be making an actual object that's gonna live in memory. Uh, given only the name of the class template, for example here, std pair, um, and constructor arguments, in my example, 1729 and taxicab. So we're going to use the usual template arm deduction rules for function templates that we are moderately familiar with depending on how much of a library implementer we are. Um, and overload resolution to figure out what actual um, concrete type we want to construct. Um, in this case, because 1729 is an R value of type int, and taxicab is a string literal of, uh, and it's an L value of type const care 8 because of the null terminator, um, CTAD runs and produces the type 
pair of int and consecrate star. We'll see how this happens later. Um, a little bit of extra help is needed from the STL called deduction guides. Um, okay, so CTAD is not restricted to pair and tuple, although those are, those are very popular. If you've worked with our multi-threading library um, in the STL, uh, you may need to take locks. And you do not want to say dot lock and dot unlock. That's not the RAII way you will end up leaking if an exception is thrown or if you early return. Instead, you want to use these lock guards. They are templated on the mutex type because the standard library has many different mutex types and it can work with user-defined mutexes. So if I want to take a shared lock, I used to have to say shared lock of shared mutex. Now I can just say shared lock because I'm super not interested in the fact that the lock guard is templated on the shared mutex. That's just sort of an implementation detail. So I lose nothing here by omitting the actual type. Um, works with lock guard, works with scope lock. Here this is a variadic template that is templated on multiple mutexes. And I get to omit the fact that this is a, sh a scoped lock for both shared mutex and the plain mutex. So this is a big win in verbosity. In fact, I was able to get this lock line on just a slide without wrapping. You know, that's big. Um, OK, so you might say, OK, that's, that's tiny, and I don't use the multi-threading library. Uh, what I consider the coolest feature of CTAD in the standard library is the std array. So here I have a more complicated example. I want to make a std array of C++17 std string views because I can. And it's going to be initialized with you know, four completely, uh, words complete, uh, completely chosen at random. Then I would like to sort them in reverse lexicographic order. And then I'd like to print out the size of the array and each element. Um, so here I print out that I have four elements in a reverse order at stag, lion, dragon, direwolf. Um, so look at that array construction. I was able to say, I just want an array. The type information that they are string views is already in the initializers. Here I'm using um, the CS plus 17 user-defined string literals, um, or user-defined literals with the SV suffix. But I could have said, you know, uh, string view brace and then the string literals if I wanted. And I did not need to specify how many elements there are. This is super cool. Um, the fact that I'm able to say, you know how many elements there are, I just told you I don't need to redundantly specify that I wanted four. Um, so there's a deduction guide that's doing this non-trivial transformation. We'll see how that works. As a user, I just need to know that it works. Um, also, as a fairly minor feature, um, I can construct an object of type greater void. This is the CS plus 14 transparent operator functors um, that I proposed and uh, was accepted in the CS plus 14 uh, that can compare arbitrary things without specifying the type. You used to have to say uh, greater open angle bracket, close angle bracket to name the type, and then open brace, close brace to get an object of that type, or parentheses if you like. Now you can omit those angle brackets uh, because there's a default template argument um, going back to CS plus 98. It's a very minor win, but if you end up wanting to reverse sort things or pass, you know, plus, you can just say brace, brace, or multiplies, brace, brace, when working with algorithms. Um, uh, finally, one of the uh, other non-trivial examples of CTAD in the library is range construction. Uh, most constructors of class templates in the STL will work with CTAD if there's sufficient type information, and there is in the case of a vector. So here I have an example. Um, I start with a list of a pair of int and string. Here I am naming the type in full because my initializers are ints and string literals, not std strings. So I need to say that I want a std string um, in the type of the list. I could have used uh, UDLs here, but I chose not to. Um, then I want to construct a vector from the elements of the, this list in reverse order. Yes, it is admittedly contrived, but this will work with any you know, vector range construction. And I can simply say I want a vector, and it's going to end up being a vector of pair and int and string. Um, and I can use a structured binding in CS plus 17 um, to print out um, each of the elements. Okay, so look at the type transformation that's happening here. My arguments to my constructor are of a verbose type, list parent string reverse iterator, uh, which is actually a std reverse iterator of std list pair in string iterator. That's the real type. Um, somehow, CTAD is looking at that type and the fact that we're calling the range constructor and says, aha, I know what vector type you want. I, don't, I know you don't want any of this reverse, ver, reverse iterator and std list stuff. I know you just want a vector of the element type, vector of parent string. So there's a transformation that happens there. And if you're aware of it, now you can use it when you construct your own vectors. And as a user, you don't need to know how the transformation happens. You just need to know that it happens. This is true for all of the sequence containers um, and the other containers in the standard library. Um, we did some significant work to make all of this work. Okay, so 
We're C++ programmers. The moment we try to use a new feature, we're probably going to encounter a compiler error. Some of these are expected um, because there's no possible way that this code could work. Uh, but don't be intimidated by the confusing looking nature of these compiler errors. The compiler is trying to tell you um, what is going on. Okay, so here's an example. What if I try to construct a std pair from nothing? And I just say pair p brace brace. Um, this definitely cannot work because pair is templated on two things and I've provided no information. Um, so here, a uh, compiler that I chose at random will say error, no viable constructor or deduction guide for deduction of template arguments of pair. Here the compiler is trying to say, I need template arguments and I cannot possibly figure out what they are. There's no default um, template arguments on std pair, unlike std greater, this is why it can't work. Um, you might say, oh, but if I have a pair p and then later on I say p equals brace, um, or p equals some other pair, could information flow backwards and the compiler deduce what I wanted when I default constructed the pair? And the answer is no. In C++, type information almost never flows backwards, certainly never backwards through multiple statements like that. I had to say almost because there's one or two cases, um, possibly more, but very few. Not in this case, though. Um, Another example, this one is actually enforced by the STL. What if I tried to use that cool uh, CTAD uh, technique for array, but what if my elements weren't all the same type? What if I try to construct a std array from 11 and 22 and some sneaky double 3.14? The compiler will complain that there's a static assert, and it's going to point into the STL um, because we have a static assert message there. And here in our implementation, we quote the standard or a working paper of it. Um, saying, hey, there's a requirement that all of the element types be the same. You could imagine a world in which the standard library was specified to somehow take all of these inconsistent element types and produce a common type. We have that template metaprogramming machinery, it's very complicated, but we chose not to use it in the standard. Um, instead, we will require that all the types be exactly the same after decay, um, and if they're not, the program is ill-formed. This is how we enforce it with a static cert. We'll see later how library implementers do it. Um, but as a user, we need to know that this requirement is there. Um, finally, one of the most interesting cases is where CTAD could possibly work, but not with the core language as it stands. Uh, suppose that you try to construct a shared putter or a unique putter from a raw pointer, and we want to give ownership of the raw pointer to the shared putter or the unique putter. The type information is definitely there. If I knew up a std string or if I already have a std string star and I try to give it to shared putter's constructor, I would expect as a programmer that this would work, but instead we're going to get the usual error um, for CTAD, no viable constructor or deduction guide. And why is that? Well, there's a limitation in the core language going back to C++ 98, and that's when you new up an individual object, or if you new up an array of such objects, the type produced is the same. We just get pointer to std string, and yet they are very different. We need to delete them either through plain delete or delete square brackets. The type information does not carry the extra information we need as to whether this is a pointer to an individual object or an array of objects. So we can't choose. And trying to guess and default to, say, shared putter to scalar would be bad. So instead, it fails to compile. Um, in this case, it actually fails to compile automatically. We didn't need to go out of our way to make it compile. Um, in any event, um, you probably shouldn't be trying to construct shared putter unique putter directly from raw pointers. You should be using make shared or make unique, so this is not really a limitation in practice. Okay, there are real limitations to CTAD, um, some of which may be fixed in the future. Uh, you should be aware of them as a user of CS plus 17, uh, because these things may change in CS plus 20, but they won't work right now. Um, there's a paper uh, going through the standardization uh, process by Mike Spurtis and Timur Doomler, um, which proposes fixing some of these limitations. Uh, hopefully it will be well received and these will be lifted. Um, currently CTAD doesn't work with alias templates and it doesn't work with explicit template arguments. Um, these are somewhat likely to be encountered as a user. Um, also as a library implementer, um, you need to provide deduction guides if you want it to work with aggregates, uh, like std array, that's an aggregate. Um, and inherited constructors, uh, but that's a more advanced sort of thing. Um, with alias templates, there's basically no workaround that I can tell um, other than actually naming the underlying type. Um, here I have an example where what if I want an alias template for a reversed set? Um, so I can say uh, reverse set of key is set of key and let's uh, use std greater there to reverse the comparison. Then if I try to use CTAD, I might expect this to work. Why can't I just say reverse set R equals brace 11, 22, 33, like I can with an ordinary set? Well, we're going to get a compiler error that says, error, you can't use this yet. Wait three years, maybe. 
So just be aware that this is out there. Um, also, and this is actually uh, pretty sad, I think, uh, because I would like it to work. Um, CTAD is all or none. Either you provide no explicit template arguments, in which case CTAD can help you, or you provide all of them and you explicitly specify. Um, here, if I try to say, I want an array of std string, uh, because I know I want a std string, I want to construct that from string literals, uh, but I would like you to, de to deduce how many strings there are, um, it's not going to work with CTAD. You're going to get an error, and it's going to be the classic CS plus 98 era error saying, too few template arguments, I need an N, and there's no default, and I can't deduce it. Um, this may be lifted in the future. Um, okay, so now let's step up to library code. What if I'm a library author, and I want to support CTAD in my code? Well, we need to know when it's going to work automatically. Um, how to distinguish the situations where we don't need to do anything because the language will implicitly do the right thing versus when it may do something we don't want or when we definitely need to provide a deduction guide. So here's the cases where it works automatically. Let's suppose I have a very simple implementation of a pair. Here I have my pair templated on A and B, and I have a constructor. The constructor itself is not further templated. It just takes const A ref and const B ref. This will work automatically with CTAD, although perhaps it won't do what you expect in some cases. Um, the construction of MP1 is expected and desirable. If I construct a, one of these my pairs from arguments 1729 and 3.14, the types of those arguments are int and double. CTAD will deduce with no extra code my pair of int double. This is actually CS plus 98 code. I'm not using anything interesting there. Um, and yet CTAD will work with that existing code. That's really cool. Um, we'll see how that works later. Um, however, if I try to construct my pair from the arguments 22 and meow, C2 will, uh, CTAD will work there, but we might not get the type that we expect. In this case, the type deduced, um, which we could see in error messages if we try to give it to something that doesn't expect this, or with is same as we saw in the very first example, the type is my pair of int and care five. Uh, while doing a dry run, I ran this path past another standard library developer, um, and he looked at this and he said, don't you mean const care 5 there? And no, it is care 5. The reason why is the original CS plus 98 rules for template arm deduction. Imagine I'm calling a function template that takes templated const a ref and const b ref. Uh, and for b, I give the argument const care 5 l value. Template arm deduction will try to say, OK, what argument could I put in place for b that will make that type um, equal to const care 5. So if I want the whole thing um, to match a const care 5, then b itself will be just the care 5, because I've said the const outside. This is how C++ 98 template argument deduction works, uh, which you should be familiar with if you're a library implementer. Um, this has relevance to CTAD because now it can appear in the type of the class template. So while that was fine for function templates, we may not want just plain care 5 to be in the type of the class template that we get. If you don't want CTAD to do this, especially if you know, you're taking const references and you could have string literals coming in or other um, similar scenarios, you'll need a deduction guide because std pair does not behave like this. We saw std pair gave us const care star. We'll see how. Um, so CTAD works automatically when we have non-templated constructors, but not always. Um, just because something is constructible doesn't mean that CTAD will work with it. Um, here's an example which is quite straightforward. Imagine I have another class, this is also kind of pair-ish, here I'm calling it peppermint, that's templated on A and B. And I can have a constructor that takes just const a ref. And I can certainly construct it from just that int if I have a peppermint of int and double. But if I try to use CTAD, what if I try to construct a peppermint of some types that CTAD will guess from 22. I'm going to get an error, as I've sort of foreshadowed here with the red highlighting. Um, the error is going to be somewhat verbose, but it's going to say, I can't deduce what you want because the constructor for peppermint is templated on only A. And I need to also know what B is. And this constructor doesn't let me infer what the template argument is. Uh, the final extra note here is about the copy deduction candidate, uh, which we'll see much, much later in the expert section. Um, so just because we have a non-templated constructor that can be used to construct an object doesn't mean that CTAD will work with it. It actually has to mention all of the class templates, uh, template parameters in there. In general, there are some exceptions. Um, here's a more involved example. So here I have another pair-like thing. Um, here I've got templated on A and B a struct jazz, and it has a constructor from both A star and B star. 
Now, because this mentions both of the class template's parameters, this is likely to work with CTAD. In fact, it does. If I have an int and a const double, I can construct a jazz using CTAD with the address of i and address of d, and this will deduce a to be int and b to be const double. I can also construct a jazz if I specify that the types are int and int uh, from the address of i and null putter. So it is constructible. But if I try to use CTAD with address of i and null putter, I'm going to get the usual CTAD error saying, I can't deduce what you want. And the reason why is in the note that's a little below in the error message. It says, candidate template ignored could not match B star against null putter T. Uh, because if you've looked at null putter T, that is not a pointer type. It is a special type in the type system that is convertible to any pointer type. So if the compiler is doing template argument deduction and it needs to figure out what B is in the type B star, and your argument is null putter T, there is no choice of B that could make that equal to null putter T. Certainly it's convertible once we have a concrete type, but we can't possibly choose some specific B there. So template argument deduction will fail. That's a rule going back to CS plus 11 as soon as null putter was introduced. This now has relevance to CTAD. Um, however, if a constructor doesn't mention all of the template arguments of the class template, CTAD may still work um, if we have default template arguments. This is critical for std vector and for possibly your own types if you have default template arguments. So here I have a type that vaguely looks like a std vector. I have a template on type name t and type name alloc that has a default template argument of allocator t. But this could be anything. Um, and it has a constructor um, from const t ref. This will work with CTAD. If I try to construct a spot from 11, then CTAD will say, OK, uh, it's, it's going to go through a somewhat involved process. We'll see how that works later. But it's going to look at the constructor that takes const t ref and says, OK, I can deduce what t is. t is going to be int. Now, I can't deduce what alloc is because you didn't mention in the constructor. But there is a default template argument on the class template itself. So I'll use that and I'll substitute in, um, as we would hopefully expect. So we get a spot int allocator int. Um, so CTAD can work if you don't mention everything, as long as there's defaults. So as I said, the criteria for CTAD automatically working is when there is enough type information in the constructor. Um, I've said that the constructor should be non-templated. It is possible for a templated constructor to automatically work with CTAD. There's an expert example at the, the back of the presentation. But in general, it's just going to mention um, the parameters of the class template. Um, or they need to come from default template arguments. The things that inhibit CTAD from automatically working are when we don't mention all of the class template's uh, parameters and there aren't any defaults. Um, it's also possible that the actual arguments at construction time prevent deduction, like we saw with the null putter argument. Um, or if your parameters prevent deduction. So if your constructor takes a list t double colon iterator, um, as library authors, we learned fairly quickly that that double colon uh, creates a non-deduced context. I haven't shown a fully worked example here, uh, but you can imagine the compiler error in your head. So if we have a situation where CTAD doesn't automatically work, but we want it to work, we need to provide this thing that I've been talking about called a deduction guide. This is new to CS plus 17. Um, so here's an example where we have a templated constructor. Here I have a myvec templated on T, and I have a constructor further templated on an iterator type it. Now, the constructor takes two iterators it, and it doesn't mention t anywhere. So this breaks the connection that CTAD needs uh, to work automatically. It doesn't break it for all the other constructors. Those can still work if they mention t directly, but this one won't work with CTAD. So we actually need to help the compiler by providing this thing called a, deduct a deduction guide. Looks a little weird when you first see it, um, but it will become quite natural once you write, um, say, 20 trillion of them in the STL. Um, so here is the hello world for deduction guides. Um, I have my class template as usual, completely unaffected. Deduction guides are non-intrusive. You put them outside the class template in the same namespace. Um, and it looks like template on type name it, myvec paren it it, and it looks like a constructor. But instead of having an open brace, we have an arrow after it. And after the arrow, we put the type that we want CTAD to generate. In this case, given an iterator type, we want to get to the type of the dereferenced iterator. There's a helper in the STL called iterator traits for this. So now if I have a pointer um, to an int and I try to range construct a vector um, from a couple of these pointers, so it's going to be an empty vector, um, CTAD will say, OK, you've got a couple arguments here of type int star. And I'm going to see if CTAD can work automatically. It's going to look at all the constructors, and it's not going to work because we said the, construct, uh, the connection was broken. Then it's also going to consider the deduction guides. 
This guide does succeed in template arm deduction, and it figures out, OK, the iterator type it is in star. So the type that I need to produce is, let's go through iterator traits. Oh, you want a myvec int. Then it will actually construct an object. We'll look into more how this works in a little bit. So another case where CTAD's automatic connection is broken is in perfect forwarding. Here I have an advanced pair, which is much closer to what std pair does, templated on A and B. And then we have a constructor, perfect forwarding constructor, that takes T ref ref and U ref ref. Because the constructor's arguments don't mention A and B, we have again broken the connection that CTAD relies on. Um, so we need to provide a, de a deduction guide to make this work. And we would like to imitate, in this case, std pair which does the transformation known as decay. I can't get into that in the time available, but if you're a library implementer, you're familiar with decay. Um, make pair does some extra stuff with unref wrapping that nobody actually ended up caring about. It was hugely controversial in the committee. Uh, we decided not to do it in, in the deduction guide, and all was fine. Um, so we're not going to do any of that. So how can we do std decay? If you said, oh, I know how to do that std decay t, correct. Uh, but that would be needlessly verbose. There is an interesting trick that you can use here. I believe uh, Ji Hao Wan had uh, come up with this in the committee. Um, and when we write the deduction guide, we can write a deduction guide um, taking its arguments as if by value. This is very strange because when we're doing perfect forwarding, we, the last thing we want to do is take by value. In this case, this is actually exactly what we want. So if I write this deduction guide, advanced pair taking x and y, arrow, and then producing advanced pair of x and y, this produces the behavior that we saw with std pair. Um, here I can construct my advanced pair, and I'm going to get an advanced pair of int and const care star. So this, if you're a library implementer, I believe is the most important slide to understand how this works, because decay by value is such a crucial trick to understand. So how does this thing work? When we ask CTAD to use this deduction guide, we're asking it to perform function template argument deduction um, for a hypothetical signature taking its arguments by value. Um, if we've written templates in CS plus 98 through 14, uh, we know how template arg deduction decays when taking arguments by value. Um, if that succeeds, um, and it deduces the type, in this case, int and const care star, um, then we will tell it to produce the type advanced pair of x and y that were deduced. We could further transform it if we wanted. We could say x star if we wanted. In this case, we just want x and y directly. Um, this turns out to be much more convenient and friendlier to compiler throughput and error messages than replicating that perfect forwarding signature and using std to kt, which we could do if we wanted, um, but we don't need to. Um, so this is also a very important slide for library implementers. Decay by value illustrates something else, and it's that CTAD runs before overload resolution for the constructor. CTAD works in sort of a very small universe. It takes the inputs, which are the constructor arguments, the actual arguments that the user is constructing an object with. It considers all of the constructors of your class template and all of the deduction guides that have been provided. It's going to perform template argument deduction and overload resolution for a bunch of hypothetical function templates derived from the constructors um, and deduction guides. And if you have a complicated overload set, um, like say basic strings constructors do, you will need to walk through mentally how this works. The examples I've presented so far are very limited in the sense they've only had a couple of constructors at most and a deduction guide. Um, usually you don't need to do that full analysis. You can just sort of eyeball it and say, yeah, I think I know what CTAB is going to do there. But in reality, it is performing template arm deduction and overload resolution for these hypothetical function templates. And then if template arm deduction and overload resolution succeed, then the output of CTAD is a single unique type. And it says, OK, you want to construct uh, my advanced pair of int and const care star. Or you might get CTAD failure when it's ambiguous or nothing is deducible. And then the compiler will stop compilation and say, whoa, I don't know what you want. Um, please tell me. So once an actual type has been deduced by CTAD, then construction of that object happens normally. And in particular, overload resolution for the constructor to select happens. This is a second round of overload resolution, but now for the constructors of the specific type that was generated by CTAD. Um, the deduction guides are not considered here. They don't have any influence here. This is why we were able to use a deduction guide that depicted taking its arguments as if by value, and yet we did not interfere with my advanced pairs or std pairs um, perfect forwarding. 
Um, in the example CTAD used, that deduction guide taking x and y by value, it generated the type, adva my advanced pair of int and const care star, and then using that type, we ran overload resolution normally, and we selected the perfect forwarding constructor, and we generated code like that. So CTAD does not affect the actual construction. Very important to understand, because for most types, you don't need to know this, but when the deduction guide differs from the constructor that you're selecting, like it does in the perfect forwarding scenario, this is critical to understand for a library implementer. Um, finally, I'd mentioned that std array was able to enforce that type requirement. Um, the means to do so are a little hacky because we can't directly in the, in the deduction guide stick a static assert, uh, but we can with a helper template. There may be other techniques, but this is the one that uh, we used in the STL. Um, so if I have a struct my array, which resembles the std array, um, I can provide a deduction guide. I want to decay the arguments um, if they happen to be you know, top level const or something. So I write a deduction guide taking as if by value first and rest dot a dot and I'm going to produce a my array type. I can count the number of arguments by using one plus size of dot dot rest. That's cool, but that's not the trick here to enforce the requirement. The trick is that I can use a helper struct and I can give all of the argument types to it, and then that can have a static assert. Here I'm using the CS plus um, uh, type trade conjunction V, that's an and, and I could use a fold expression there if you know what those are. Um, I'm going to say that all the types need to be the same, and then, assuming that static assert succeeds, um, I will produce any of the types, in this case the first type, because they're all the same. And then I will grab that in the, in the deduction guide. So this forces the static assert to be evaluated. I can also put a message in there, as I did in the actual STL. In this case, this is a terse static assert that won't emit any message. Um, so that's how you can enforce requirements. Um, you could also force a deduction guide to always fail if you wanted. We didn't end up needing to do that in the STL because shared putter and unique putters deduction automatically failed um, for reasons that I can explain if you're interested. So if you are a library developer, um, regardless of whether your library is publicly used or just internally used within your company, um, if you want to support CTAD in a comprehensive manner, you should look at all of the constructors of all of your class templates. That won't take long, will it? Uh, you should ask, okay, is CTAD even applicable? Sometimes the answer is no, and that's totally okay. For example, std vector of t has a constructor um, taking size type, size t. Um, it's going to construct, you know, n objects of that type and uh, value initialize them. There's no possible way that CTAD can work with that because the length doesn't carry any type information. I can't just say I want a vector of 10, 10 watts. Um, so CTAD doesn't work for that. We don't try to. And we don't need to block it because CTAD will automatically fail. Um, now, if CTAD does automatically work, you need to ask, is it going to do what I want? We saw with the, my basic pair example that sometimes it doesn't due to how template arm deduction works. And in that case, you would need to write a, de a deduction guide. Um, if you have dual mode code or multi-mode code, if you support many standard versions, um, deduction guides will not compile. They're just invalid syntax in CS14. You need to guard them based on compiler support, and you can use feature test macros now. Um, double underscore CPP deduction guides is the feature test macro for CTAD. Um, and then finally, you can static assert with very basic tests um, that each of these constructors successfully works with CTAD. This is important, even if it seems really trivial, because changing type defs in a class or adding constructors or other deduction guides could potentially cause ambiguities in the future. It's good to verify upfront that all of the CTAD is going to work. Um, so I promised in the abstract that there would be a bunch of corner cases. Uh, I will go over one of them, and I've got bonus slides for more if you're very interested. Um, we're looking pretty good on time. Um, these scenarios are weird, and I'm going to show you a little bit of weird code, but this should not be imitated. Um, this is merely to explore how CTAD works. Um, hopefully you won't get into terrible situations where this knowledge is necessary. But if you are a basic string maintainer or anything that resembles basic string, you will need to know such things. I am sorry. Um, don't imitate this. Don't imitate basic string. It's bad. Make your constructor simple. Um, OK, so here's an example. I'd mentioned non-deduced context. What happens if we have a constructor taking something like a std list of t double colon iterator? Here I have the simplest type trait in the world, identity. Um, this will be, become type identity in CS plus 20. That just takes a type and returns it. What if I have a constructor taking type name identity of t type? We know from earlier slides that if we had just taken ordinary t, this would work fine with CTAT. But if my constructor is written as taking type name identity t double colon type, this inhibits CTAT. Um, I'm going to get an error saying, note, candidate template ignored, couldn't infer template argument t. 
This is due to how CTAD works automatically. It's gonna consider the constructors, generate these hypothetical function templates I've been referring to, and then it's gonna to try to run ordinary function template argument deduction, but we know, as experts, that we cannot deduce types to the left of a double colon. Um, so this non-deduced context, which was totally fine before C17, because without CTAD, at the time we considered the constructor, we knew what the type T was. So the fact that it was you know, double colon didn't affect us. Now it does. Um, so either avoid non-deduced context or provide a deduction guide for this scenario. Um, if you happen to have an internal type def to your class, uh, here using u equals type name identity t type. That's the only difference between these examples. Um, that does not affect the compiler error. We still get the error note candidate template ignored because CTAD sees through the type def in some sense. So having nested type def does not affect the non-deduced context thing. But note that nested type defs in and of themselves do not inhibit CTAD. Um, here I have a simple struct, template type name t struct per. But for whatever reason, the STL does this fairly commonly, we have a type def inside, and I've written this with the new using syntax, and this could be the old type def syntax as well, using u equals t. If my constructor takes u, you might think, without seeing that it actually works, hmm, if I were to refer to this outside the class, it would look like per of t double colon u. Doesn't that sort of implicit double colon inhibit CTAD? The answer is no. For CTAD, it sees through direct type defs like this, and it succeeds. Now, as a library implementer, I cannot actually point to the line in the standard that makes this work. Um, if you're a core expert, maybe come up to me after the talk and tell me why this works. Um, I'm not sure exactly why I can see through nested type defs, but it does. Uh, this is very good because in the STL, we extensively use nested type defs like value type, allocator type, um, internal type defs, and none of them needed to change for CTAD because we didn't introduce non induced context. Okay. Um, so I've got some bonus slides and I have time for questions. If you have more info, or if you want more info, um, here's the implementation history in Visual Studio. Um, there are separate implementation histories for Clang and GCC, but I'm not an expert on them, so I'll let those maintainers um, talk about that. Um, we actually implemented CTAD very early on um, in the STL. In update 15.6, which went out many months ago, we implemented the STL with Clang, because Clang 5 supported CTAD. Um, so even though uh, C1XX had not yet implemented CTAD, we implemented all of the guides and did all of the testing um, in the library, and we announced this on VCBlock. Um, in fact, this found two compiler bugs, one major, one minor, in Clang 5, which I reported upstream, and which they fixed for Clang 6. So if you use Clang 6 or above, you don't need to care about what those bugs are. If you need to support Clang 5, and you have anything resembling std optional, you will care. Um, I can dig up that bug number if you want. Then, with the full support and tests in the standard library, the compiler team was able to implement CTAD um, in the next update, VS 2017-15-7, um, and they were able to do it without uh, having any compiler bugs I needed to report, because all of the tests were right there. So this was a great example of how supporting Clang also made MSVC better, um, and we made Clang better. It was really great. Um, and then in VS 2017-15-8, which is the current production update, uh, we ship feature test macros in the compiler and standard library, with the exception of HasCPP attribute that will be implemented later. Um, so this is the update where you can test double underscore CPP deduction guides. And if that's defined, you know that you're working with 15.8 uh, or another compiler that also defines the uh, feature test macro um, and support CTAD. The actual value of it has varied. There's like three different values. It's had a somewhat complicated history. Um, if you care, then uh, we can tell you exactly what values were supported and which papers appeared. Uh, but for all but the most corner cases, just the definedness of the macro is sufficient. Um, here I've got uh, the link shortener to the CS plus 20 working paper, which I encourage you to consult if you need to know the details of how CTAD works. Um, I've got a list here of the core papers that were voted in. Um, it went in at the last moment and needed lots of fixing. Uh, in fact, some after CS plus 17, we've implemented all of these DRs. Um, those are the papers that affected core so far. Um, and the two papers that went into the library, these are actually hyperlinks in the presentation itself, but you can get to them um, by using that link shortener. If you go to HPS colon slash slash wg21.link slash paper number, like P0512, that will redirect you to openstid.org, and it's so much nicer than knowing that URL. That's actually officially supported now by the um, standardization committee. Um, so before I get to questions, I had been mentioning to people, um, hey, come to my CTAD talk, and I'm going to have some bonus slides. Um, the bonus slides, uh, which uh, I encourage experts to review um, when the slides go up, are corner cases. There's many corner cases, like how tuple and optional avoid wrapping, 
Um, what happens with initializerless overloading is uh, Nikolai Yosudis um, had examples of um, these are not really CTAD. This is more uniform initialization, but CTAD is involved here. Um, and uh, more interesting corner cases uh, suggested by our compiler dev, uh, Zhang Fan, about how CTAD runs before overload resolution. It's possible for CTAD to succeed and overload resolution to fail um, if you have very complicated types. Uh, please don't write constructor overload sets like this, but if you do and you get bizarre compiler errors, then you need to know how this works um, and how to avoid situations like that. It's also possible um, for deduction guides and constructors to compete during this early phase of overload resolution that runs during CTAD. Um, there's a rule which you will need to learn if you're an expert about when to prefer deduction guides versus the things generated from constructors. Um, interestingly, um, deduction guides don't always win. They win as a tiebreaker. Um, if one hypothetical function template is considered more specialized, it wins outright early on in the tiebreaker phase. And only if they're equally good matches do the deduction guides win. So if you're an extreme expert, you know, maintaining boost or something, you'll need to know stuff like this. Um, if you maintain basic string, life is super horrible. There was actually a bug in the standard. I've got a link there, LWG 3076, uh, where basic strings constructors created ambiguity for CTAD in a really pernicious manner. And the fix was to constrain these constructors in a way that we had never constrained before, you know, to boldly constrain, where no one has constrained before. Um, don't be like basic string. It hurt my head writing up those library issues. You can read the, the full history um, in that issue. Um, so by the way, here is a very quick four slide preview of my C++ 2019, or my CPVCon 2019 talk, CareConf, C++ 17's final boss. Has nothing to do with CTAD, but it's standard library related. Um, this is a very cool library, seems very small at first, um, that is just a couple overloads from cares and to cares that can convert integer and floating points to, to a string and from a string. Very low level, doesn't handle white space, which may be problematic for you, but not for me, because the standard says so. Um, doesn't handle locale, so no commas, decimal point, just you get a period. Um, very few options, but it's bounds checked. Um, doesn't do null termination on input and output, so you can just read stuff from a long documented memory. Doesn't allocate memory, doesn't throw exceptions, and the performance is amazing. Um, so here's our implementation progress. Uh, the integer performance is not yet amazing in Visual Studio. We will optimize it later. Uh, the from cares performance is pretty good, and the two cares performance is amazing. It's powered by a new algorithm from Ulf Adams of Google. Um, that was, uh, he gave a talk in, I believe, June, uh, very recently. Um, and it's already shipping, and it's going to ship in VS 2017-59, the upcoming update. Um, this generates, for floating point number, the shortest uh, amount of decimal digits that preserves all of the information in the float. Um, and it does so in record speed. And in fixed notation, we're also making that one faster. Um, it's a lot of source code, it's a lot of tests, and we still have more work to do, uh, but we are pretty far along um, before completely 100% finishing CS plus 17 in the standard library. So you might ask, well, Stefan, how fast is it? And it is ridiculously fast. Um, here is a speed up table um, comparing two cares to uh, sprintf, in this case, sprintf underscore s, the secure overload in our CRT that does bounds checking. I wanted to have a fairly fair comparison with the format specifiers %.ae and %.16e that generate all of the digits in sprintf necessary to round trip. Um, and the results, they vary based on whether you're x86 or x64, what backend you're using, and whether you're converting a float or a double. But it's anywhere from 9.6 times faster to 36.6 times faster in absolute terms. SprintFS was taking like 1,700 nanoseconds to convert a double on x64. And now we can do it in 46.6 nanoseconds on my fairly old, um, I think it's Haswell refresh machine. Um, this is amazing. It is faster than all known previous algorithms. If you've heard of Dragon 4, Grisu 3, Grisu 2, Errol, it's faster than all of them due to Ulf Adams' uh, amazing algorithm. And it's now available to you in CareConf form. Fixed notation is not quite as fast, but it's pretty good fast. It's well, you know, about four times faster than the CRT, and we're working on making it um, even faster. Scientific is better. Uh, okay, so questions about uh, CTAD. We've got 10 minutes. Um, so would you mind going back to slide 27? 27, okay. Rewind time. 
Unfortunately, these slides are bi-directional and not random access. <laughs> okay, non-templated constructors, yes. Okay, so, uh, 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 so you, you showed us this example where uh, uh, it deduces one way uh, that is probably not the way you want, uh, and you'll need a deduction guide if you want, the way, want it the way you want. So suppose I, suppose I wrote my pair, it's out in the wild, uh, and it's potentially getting, and, and some of my users uh, may have started using C++ 17 already. Yes. Uh, so if I add that deduction guide, I might break them. Yes. Uh, uh, do you have any thoughts on, uh, on what I can do about that? Um, if, if the deduction, for, so for example, suppose this ships to users and they start using CTAD, and they start writing stuff like MP1 and they're happy, and then they start writing stuff like MP2. Um, I, I'm trying to figure out how could the deduce type there be so good that the users would end up shipping that in their code to their end users, and so bad that you would need to change it in a deduction guide. I could imagine scenarios where it might deduce something that leads to like inefficient code, um, but usually the way that this works with the, um, the const ref potentially stripping off constness or stripping off referenceness, um, the difference in type is not going to be subtle. It's going to be fairly major, like no, well, no const there, const there. Um, I don't have a good answer, because if, they, if you have users that are very aggressive on you know, jumping on this and using CTAD automatically before you've had a chance to provide a, a deduction guide, um, then are they going to be the sort of users that can aggressively update their code when you start uh, providing a deduction guide? Hopefully, yes. So it might end up being a non-problem. Um, we have not encountered that in the STL simply because our CTAD support um, happened at the same time as the compiler. So I guess the answer there would be implement CTAD with deduction guides as fast as you can before people update their compilers and then start maybe getting into trouble. But I think it's going to be a very small issue if, if that. Thank you. A uh, uh, question. So um, it's actually two parts. One is, mm -hmm. great, I can do array, I can do vector, map. Uh, yeah. Doesn't yes. seem to have a CDAT. Um, yes, a uh, map and initializer list. It does have some CTAD, um, but if you want to construct a map from like brace, brace, one comma two, brace, CTAD is not very happy. I was actually worrying if somebody would ask me that question, you'll notice the complete lack of map examples here. Uh, the problem is it does have attempted CTAD for initializer list, but what you, what you start off with is just a bunch of braces. Um, so if you tag every one of the inner braces with pair um, using CTAD there, you can get CTAD to work. Um, but tagging just the first one does not appear to work in my experience, although I may have been screwing something up, um, and just omitting it entirely. Um, this appears to be just a limitation in CTAD itself that might be lifted in the future. The problem is that, that those braces have no type, and CTAD really wants a type. There's also some additional headaches with maps specifically uh, relating to the constants of the key. There's a library issue um, that I need to look into revising that. Um, but my impression from looking at this a little is it's just not ready for braces there. Well, uh, uh, so if I come across a container library that doesn't have a uh, certain initializer list and I have to write the guidelines for it, right. can I? Are there sort of rules about writing a guideline for a library that's not your own, can I just stick in my own namespace? Do they uh, observe namespaces? What are the deduction ah, guides? Ah, yes. Um, deduction guides, do they work if you've just dragged in a namespace, if they, they come from another namespace? I actually do not know the rules there, um, because all the STL's guides live in, a, in, in, in its own namespace, and namespace stood. Um, I, I would, I, it, the standard could go either way. It could say that CTAD looks up exclusively in the names, namespace and the associated namespaces of the class, or it's going to consider everything that in scope. Um, I do not know which one it is. I encourage you to look at the standard and figure it out. Um, but the guidelines for how to write guides, if you, I would definitely recommend looking at all of the standards guides. The guides as depicted in the standard um, are generally pretty simple. Um, there are a couple like std array and the bizarre ones for the associative containers that conceal some magic in the requirements. But most of them are just depicted right there and have been essentially copy pasted into our implementation. They handle all these scenarios like decaying and transforming into pointer to element types, not everything, but a fair number of cases. And, and is it considered bad behavior if I wrote my own for some other library that's like sort of, they're not gonna update it. I have yeah, to assuming, this today. assuming that it will consider things in another namespace or if you just inject guides into that library's namespace, that's 
probably OK, as long as you remove them if that library does support, start supporting CTAD. The reason why it's reasonably OK, um, similar to like providing your own overloads, or not, oh, sorry, non-member functions overloaded potentially in their namespace, is because CTAD is completely non-intrusive. It doesn't disrupt any existing constructions at all. Um, it only affects somebody when they emit those template arguments, which is about how we were able to add CTAD to almost every class template in the standard library without disrupting a single line of user code. Okay. I'll just add a warning there that don't add CTAD guides in your header files for foreign libraries, because that will violate ODR with deductions as people, depending on the order of the includes now. Ah. So don't do that. Yes, that's a good point. If you, if you need to add extra guides, confine it to a single CPP. But uh, I, my, my own question, let's assume I'm a bad person. I've got my nice class template, and I've got partial specializations of that class template. Yes. And my partial specializations have different constructor sets than my primary template. Yes, you are a bad person. In this case, CTAD will not do what you want, because um, when CTAD runs, you've just said, I want a my Alistair type. Um, and it's going to look at only the primary template. The primary template's constructors and any deduction guides will be used to figure out the type you want to construct. Then when the actual construction overload resolution runs, that's when your partial specializations are uh, considered. And we're going to look at, okay, what's the partial specialization for this? What's its constructors going, uh, what are its constructors going to do? So if how it handles construction is radically different from what the primary template was trying to do, you might get an incorrect constructor selected or something unexpected. Um, that's just inherent. There's no way to like, Partial, to get those partial specializations considered, you need to design the entire class hierarchy with CTAD in mind if you're trying to handle that. The STL is nothing like that, not even vector bool is that bad. Um, but in your case, you may need to uh, think about that a little harder. Well, I, that's, the, that's what I actually hoped to hear. I just hadn't been there <laughs> to have the scars yet. So okay. thank you. Excellent talk. Um, Thanks. I came in here thinking CTAD is terrible and I never want to use it, mm -hmm. and you convinced me that I was right. Um, <laughs> are any of the major compilers considering adding a diagnostic for unintentional use of CTAD? Um, how can we determine that? what is unintentional? You said you wanted a pair, and we constructed a pair, and it succeeded. How do we know that you didn't actually want that? Well, because we turned on the warning. Oh, turn on a warning. Oh, that, that's not going to be. You don't want to write MP2. Yeah, and I am perfectly willing to throw out the baby with. So, the so, so what if what if somebody doesn't money. like a uniform initialization and they want a warning? Wow, you used braces there. I don't think you wanted that. Or wow, you used um, null putter, but we're trying to use the capital null macro. I mean, a compiler could implement a warning. You could probably go implement in Clang right now, but that doesn't seem to be a very useful warning to me because what is the danger of using CTAD? It could deduce the wrong type. That seems unlikely. Um, I have not encountered cases where CTAD with the STL will deduce wrong types. Like the my pair example here might seem scary, but std pair has a, has a deduction guide because we thought about this. Um, so, I mean, yeah, the feature may do some un unexpected things, but it seems fairly low risk. Certainly much lower risk than the usual sort of, sorts of things that compiler emits warnings for. But okay. yeah, propose a, submit a pull request like to Clang, see if you can get it accepted. You're considering well, adding explicit template arguments, right? So I could have a tuple of int, int, and then, you know, maybe some other stuff. Oh, yeah, maybe to partially support. Yeah, the committee does need to think through, okay, what happens if we specified some but not all? Um, there, there are, yeah, the tuple is one of the, the most interesting cases there. So if I'm paranoid, I want to future-proof my code against future things that are... I could definitely see a warning for partial CTAD. Like, whoa, you used partial CTAD here. Did you really mean that? Depending on how unexpected it could be. Hopefully, it wouldn't be necessary. Uh, what would be the story of interoperation with meta classes? Uh, would meta classes rewrite classes and then see that apply? I cannot answer that at all. You would need to ask Herb. Um, I only know what's in the working paper. Um, I cannot even begin to speculate how CTAD would interact with meta classes. Um, I assume once a meta class has generated a class template, at that point you can ask how CTAD will interact because um, meta classes are used to stamp out other concrete things. It's like a level above templates, but I can't really answer that yet. No, I think we need some sort of talk about meta classes modifying CTAD rules mm. and guides would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs>
A uh, quick question just to check understanding. So sure. um, if you try to instantiate a class template uh, without providing the actual types, mm -hmm. um, at that point the compiler generates a hypothetical overload set by looking at any explicitly provided uh, deduction guides along with any implicitly generated uh, deduction guides for exactly the correct. copy constructor and stuff like that yes, from there's, the primary template? There's an additional copy deduction candidate that helps avoid the tuple uh, wrapping problem, but yes, that is how the process works. Okay, because I remember a while back uh, when like GCC 7 came out, I remember I tried writing a deduction guide for a variadic class that could mm -hmm. take any number of types and I started running into all sorts of overload, like ambiguous overload situations mm -hmm. that were completely baffling to me at the time and this starts to make a bit more sense. Yes, but. and I encourage you to look at the advanced examples that I had there. Um, but yeah, at some point when you're, especially with variadic templates, you need to just look at the actual standard rules in the class time bar deduction <laughs> section and say, okay, I've got to generate this hypothetical set. What's overload resolution going to do there? What's stump power reduction going to do there? Is it ambiguous? Okay, it's not. Okay, do I get the types that I want? Okay, now I've got an actual type. Let's construct it. Uh, working through that and like step by step is how I resolve the basic string issue. <laughs> And so then, uh, like the two levels of uh, overload resolution then are entirely independent. They don't really interact at all. They do not interact as all, at all, as far as I can tell. Thank you. Great. Thanks, everyone. I can ask questions later.